welcome back everybody to this latest episode of Cherry Picking. Um, and firstly, thank you for everybody watching the recent shows. Um, we had Damon Minchella on. We've also done a show about the Everton and PSR situation. Um, are Everton the Premier League's guinea pig? Uh, that is the big question. And we've had loads of shows, plus with Mark McAdam as well. Um, so firstly, thank you everybody for subscribing and, you know, if you haven't subscribed, why not do it now? Um, but he needs no introduction now. I have got my main man next to me. Manny, how are you doing, mate? All good, thank you, mate. It's uh, good to be back on for another week. And, um, you know, the Champions League football um, for the, over the past two days has been really exciting and quite thrilling. And, of course, we've got Europa League action tonight and then Premiership action on the weekend. And... Um, Away from the football, things have been going okay with me, I would say, and um, can't really say too much more, to be honest. Fair enough, mate. Fair enough. Well, one thing I do want to, and this is a slightly negative subject I do want to cover off, is trolling. Um, as everybody knows, I have been subject to this from a number of phantom accounts people that do and don't exist, um, you know, accounts that nobody knows who they are, who are there to just stir up trouble. And it's not just me. You know, when when us YouTubers, and, you know, I say that because mildly, because at the end of the day, I'm, this isn't a big channel. You know, of course, we want to grow it as much as possible. But the thing is, is us YouTubers do this content. We do this for the love of the game. We love to do this for the love of our football teams. What we don't do is, you know, do this for the barrage of abuse. And unfortunately, I'm not going to say who it was, um, but there was a particular YouTuber who I'm very, very close with who has suffered at the hands, and I'll say the team, of a group of Newcastle fans and this man you know dedicates so much time to doing a fantastic job on his channel and then for people who let's be fair these people you know wouldn't have you know and I'm gonna be I'm gonna swear wouldn't have the bollocks to do it themselves you know, to put themselves out there, to have that opinion, to be straight down the line, to offer their opinion and to be. And this man is, you know, if somebody comes back, is quite receptive to people's opinions. He appreciates them like I do and like so many others who have suffered the same, you know, at the hands of these trolls. Trolling just has to stop because... Whilst myself and this gentleman are strong enough, who's to say that the person that you might be going onto their channel and trolling might not? And we've seen so many times, you know, and I'm saying this out loud, we've seen so many times in the media that people have done, taken drastic action for things which shouldn't have been said by somebody who hasn't thought twice about what effect that that comment or that remark has had about them you know i've been i've had loads from unfortunately afc bournemouth fans or supposed fans because i don't call them that um supposedly fans you know it is time that trolling does stop and in that video, um, you know, my good friend did turn around and said, say, about Elon Musk and X need to do something about it. Twitter, formerly known as Twitter. Um, and I echo that. And the more channels that actually echo that and make a stand together, united, the better. You know, and I'm calling on all the Bournemouth channels, all the Newcastle channels, all the channels who have had, you know, even if it's one channel in a group, you know, who have had somebody abused badly, 
everybody should be united, you know, in cutting that out. Um, because A, we don't deserve it. And B, you know, we only do this for the love of our football club. And hey, if you don't like what you watch, you know, then there is an easy way. You close YouTube down and you go and do something else with your life. Why don't you make your own channel? But I wanted to start off with that point to make a united front, you know, with A, a friend, but also with the whole community to try and stamp this out. So we'll move on to more pleasant things, Manny. Um, but yeah, I thought that needed to be say said. And you've done the right thing by saying it. And um, I'm going to say, as someone who has been told that I need to get my own channel, but hasn't really had either the time or the um, ability as of yet to do it, given other commitments, um, trolling is one of the most despicable things that anyone in any community can do. And um, I'm also going to speak about, um, it's bad enough from um, people getting trolled online. It's also, it's also every bit as bad, maybe definitely even worse, actually, in fa if um, people are physically attacked for their opinions. And you might know about um, the Arsenal fan, this um, venerated gentleman, by the name of uh, Jez Collins, who hosts the Arsenal History and More um, yes. channel. How he and his wife were very viciously attacked while on an evening out um, in their um, hometown of... Um, I don't want to say their hometown. I don't want to divulge their, no, um, their whereabouts. But the fact that they were attacked by a bunch of um, thugs for... Jez daring to offer his opinions on the club as a long-time supporter. It was sickening. Disgusting. He's old yeah. enough to be my own father. And we've done several streams together. So it cut me deep as well. And I'm going to say right now, those people who see it fit to engage in trolling behavior do not deserve the honor of being called fans. They are miscreants. They are toe rags. They are every single Dickensian... Um, profanity you can think of which you can think and quite simply they do not deserve the time of um, day they do not deserve to be um, given any kind of notoriety all they're doing is really showing themselves as the um, anti-social inhuman um, scum that they are and yes I say this about the trolls because not everyone can have the attitude of you know sticks and stones can break uh, my bones, but names will never hurt me. Some of us are quite sensitive, and um, I used to be once upon a time a rather sensitive bloke myself. And probably as I've gotten older and maybe wiser in some respects, I've learned that I can't let the bastards get me down, um, to coin that phrase. But um, we can't simply just uh, tell people to um, keep calm and carry on because we don't know how many people would be affected. And I've heard of several. Um, YouTubers myself who have had to, um, you know, close down their YouTube channels and, and stop doing what they love doing because they couldn't stand being harassed anymore. So I'm really glad that you mentioned this. And to that friend of yours, I won't divulge his name. I want to say to you, we're behind you. The true football fans, regardless of club loyalties, will support you and back you against any, any idiot. You do you. Sadly, we all know that the muskrat, as I derisively call him, will not do anything to try and make Twitter, as I will still call it, a safer, nicer place. Because, you know, controversy, conflict, they sell, they add more money. The only way, um, you know, things can change is if people decide to get off Twitter completely and boycott it as a, as a service. So the stock price goes down and he's made to realize the error of his ways. Ironically, though, you know, we've seen how the company was financially affected, but that still hasn't stopped him going about his not so merry way. So at the end of the day, it really is up to all of us to make sure that we take a united stand and tell these trolls you will never win. No matter what you try and do, if any of you dare to come and attack me. I'm going to come after you harder. But even harder than that, if anyone dares to come after my friends, 
whether they be Craig Beasley or anyone else online, you're going to answer to me, and I'm making myself very clear. No, yes. I appreciate it, Manny. And, you know, sadly, sadly, Twitter X is this place that, you know, a lot of people don't want to be. Um, the world should be about free speech, but it should also be about respect and should Absolutely. be about, you know, understanding others' opinions. Like earlier on today, you know, of course, I have my views on the Everton situation. There's a whole video about it. And I was speaking to a Sheffield United fan, a good friend, um, and it was respectful. It was discussion. He didn't agree with me. I didn't agree with him. But both points were valid. And in fact, by talking, you know, I could see some things that maybe I'd forgot about. And he could see that some things that he might have forgot about. So there is all that. Um, of course, Sheffield United, you know, we didn't know this at the time as well when we was discussing this, are going to have, unfortunately, a two-point deduction um, next season providing they are in the EFL, which unfortunately does look like it's going to happen for them. But, you know, trolling does need to stop. Um, and I don't want to make it, you know, this is the last thing I'm going to say about this. You know, it doesn't matter what level it is on. You know, we have seen Joey Barton, for example. Uh. Yes, Joey Barton. You know, this is a man that I'm not really too worried or upset about when I suffer it, uh, you know, or if he come back at me um, because he is a personality and I feel that, you know, I want, I would want to put my views over to Joey Barton and say, Joey, you're wrong, but I'd listen to his and, you know, I would offer up mine afterwards. But Joey Barton, again, is another man who, uh, Gabriel Sutton, um, I can mention his name, you know, Gabriel is, again, a really, really nice gentleman, has had tons of abuse from Joey Barton. Um, and Joey Barton even went to the extent of saying some quite very, 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 you know, despicable things, especially last night. Um, so... Wednesday evening on Twitter X. So Elon Musk, if you are watching, which you probably won't be, sort it out. Yeah, yeah. I think we should move on from that. Uh, let's talk about football. Let's talk about football. And let's, well, to be honest, it's not, not as pleasant. Of course, we went to Kenilworth Road on Saturday and we were 1-0 up in this game. Um, but got pegged back by Luton, you know, a last minute goal by Luton Town. Well, 90th minute goal um, by Luton, Colton Morris. They're really putting up a fight, aren't they? Oh, you bet. You bet you're bothered they're putting up a fight. And um, one of the things I can say now is uh, do not ever underestimate a team fighting relegation. Yep. It's, it's, it reminds me of what Sylvester Stallone said in um, Creed 2. When a fighter has nothing to lose, he becomes more dangerous. And uh, that's the case with uh, teams like Luton Town and several other teams that always make it a point to um, give it as good as they can get when it comes to a relegation battle. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, unfortunately, you ended up, you lot ended up being on the, on the receiving end of that. But... Um, it probably was a game which also, I would like to think, should have given you a reminder of um, where you still are as a team and what you still have to do to try and improve. Um, if you saw the game, the first question I'd like to ask you is, how was uh, Murara Neto's performance and goal? Better. Better, I could say. Um, you know, do I have, you know, as much confidence in him as I once did? Probably not. However, the thing is, is he has, you know, he's earned his place in the lineup um, over a period of time. Goalkeepers, like we said beforehand, you know, when they make mistakes, 
it normally ends up resulting in a goal. And, you know, unfortunately for Neto, um, it has done just that, you know, on several occasions. So I feel a bit more comfortable, you know, I think, you know, even though, yes, we've beaten 2-1, he did make a very, very good save. Um, If I cast my mind back, um, you know, it was in the first half um, and, you know, a very, very good solid save. Were we the better side? Um, To be honest, I think it was probably an even match over the 90 minutes. When you look at, you know, the amount of shots, you know, Luton probably shaded it. We took our opportunity when it come. But I think some of our opportunities were probably a little bit better. Um, You know, we were breaking down the play. You know, we was playing well. First half, you know, a good performance. Second half, Luton just come back with vengeance. Let's be fair, you know, I did say to Nick Owen in the preview, and by all means, please do go and watch that because it's a really, really good preview as well as that Damon Minchella one. But I did say to Nick Owen in the preview, I said, you know, you've got to win this game. And he agreed they have to win their home games. Um, They've got Manchester City this weekend. It's very unlikely they're going to get something from that but bet my word they're going to put up a fight against Man City um, without a shadow of a doubt well here's the thing though I do know that uh, that when they played at Kenilworth Row they did put up a fight but City did um, come out on top mm-hmm. when it comes to playing at the Etihad or the empty hat as other people would call it <laughs> more often than not um, teams find it very difficult yeah. And I'm not going to blow my trumpet and say, well, we took a point off them this season. Because, look, um, we literally had to change our entire game plan to becoming a lot more defensively solid. And it worked We because we only, did not, um, we only let them have one real shot on target, um, sort of technically, I would say. And mm-hmm. uh, we literally nullified um, Erling Haaland, although a bigger issue is that he hasn't scored for quite some time. Um, he's not as prolific as he was. It's a case of second season blues. So it will be interesting to see if he's able to get over this uh, these blues and regain his confidence and start scoring again. But um, the way Luton play, you just um, have to um, accept the fact that City will now be more determined than ever to score. And they pumped Real Madrid for three at the Bernabeu with Foden and Guardiol scoring absolute peaches um, of um, goals to put them 3-2 up only for... Federico Valverde to um, rescue the tie, making it three all. And of course, because there are no away, there's no away, there are no away goals anymore. Um, it's basically uh, starting from a clean slate in the second leg. Otherwise, Real Madrid would have been under the um, under the cosh um, going into that tie. But um, back to this one, Luton will be on a hiding to nothing, and it will take every single ounce of their strength uh, strength they have. But um, I can't see anything other than the City win. I know this isn't going to make uh, Mr. Owen very happy or other Luton fans happy, but, um, you know, that's sort of the way um, that goes. But as long as Luton are able to win the games they have to win and Forrest and others are going to be affected by, you know, more point seductions and um, lose more games themselves, um, things are going to look up for the Hatters. And we've got to take our hats off to the Hatters, pun intended. Um, Forrest had their chance to try and... Um, you know, get something against Spurs at London Stadium, but they were completely uh, swept aside. Um, I mean, they did have chances of their own, don't get me wrong, but um, in the end, their defensive frailties just let them down. So, all credit to Luton. I think, um, you know, it's still hard to predict what will happen at the end of the season because everything's just so topsy-turvy. I mean, you got crazy pendulum swings one way and the other, whether it's at the top or the bottom or even in the middle. You just can't predict what the final... Um, uh, uh, the final positions in the table will be, and anyone who gets them to the letter from one to twenty, I mean, that bloke should buy a lot. Of, that person, um, bloke or lady or otherwise, should buy a lot. Of, buy a lottery ticket. Well, I'll tell you what, towards the end of the show, um, I do want to bring something up with you. Um, but to be honest. If I bring it up now, uh, you probably won't forgive me if it doesn't come true. 
But uh, I what, yeah, I, I, you know where I, I, I'm I, going I, with that, don't you? I do know where you're going with this. It dates yes. all the way back to the beginning of the season. And yes. uh, listen, mate, I'm I'm letting the chips fall where they may. So you know that you and I are always going to be on a good footing, no yeah. matter what. Excellent, excellent. Well, you know, I'm sure you got your fingers and toes crossed, hoping you know that what I'm going to come out with at the end does come to fruition um, with the team on top of the table, but we'll come back to that because uh, let's talk about the teams coming into the Premier League and the championship, the race for promotion. Do you know what? This is really exciting. It's a really, really exciting battle. You know, I know I'm very, very good, Chris, uh, good friends with Chris from Leicester till I die, but um, to be honest, they shouldn't be in this situation. They should be out of sight. Um, I remember, you know, earlier on in the season, after 20 games, you know, both Ipswich and Leicester had the most points of any team at that stage of the season. Um, so it's a very, very interesting battle. My big question, though, here is when whoever comes up automatically, We've seen Burnley and Sheffield United come up this year. Um, both sides kind of dip towards the end of last season's championship race. So the performances and the results dipped a little bit. And look at where both of them are now. Both of them look consigned to the championship, you know, going straight back down. From the three that you've seen, Leicester, Ipswich and Leeds. Do you think any of them are equipped at the moment? That is an absolutely brilliant question. And I like the way you sort of correlated really the um, issue of how um, with Sheffield United and Burnley, their form fell away near the end. I think you might have a little bit of a point because with their form falling away, they still were able to um, secure um, what they ne needed. And I think um, I think maybe that sort of um, uh, that, that form probably sort of um, carried over into the beginning of the season. They weren't able to do this. But um, the biggest issue with Burnley mm. is that Vincent Company was never really able to evolve as a manager from the type of football that saw his side completely, you know, um, blitz everyone in the championship, but come a, a complete cropper in the premiership. As good a goalkeeper as James Trafford is, company's decision to make him the number one over Arianette Murich, who was um, Burnley's star as they um, won, beat everyone against them, was a poor decision, really, because it sent a message that merit was no longer a criteria. I don't remember Murich putting a foot wrong, and yet through no fault, fault of his own, he was benched in favour of the bloke who was um, the star as England won the Euro Under-17 um, Championship, I think. I don't quite recall if it was Under-17 or Under-21. I will confirm that yeah. right now. And, um, you know, it, it was as if also the type of football they were playing was just... Um, uh, championship football in excelsis and he never was really will it willing to truly um evolve the squad by getting some more players um, in who were well suited to the team um he wasn't really willing to be proactive in taking um any kind of um, real action when the team was going through a bit of a slump saying that the team was showing fight and character and what's even worse is that burnley have also made it crystal clear that even if they do get relegated company is the man to take them back up and try and um, assist in the rebuilding process now when bournemouth had that dip in form and ended up you know um finishing barely above the relegation zone after, mm -hmm. after doing the hard work of securing um you know um top flight status the yeah. club saw it fit to um, relieve Gary O'Neill of his duties and bring Iriola in. And after a dreadful start, as you and I both know, um, that decision seems to have been vindicated with uh, Bournemouth mm. looking well on course to tally over 50 points a season. I think they just need to win three more games, earn nine points, and that takes them to, take them to even 50. If they can get more, that would be an absolute bonus for them. I do not predict that they will go on an unbeaten run until the end of the season, but... Um, Stranger things have happened. Yeah. And, uh, 
you know, that, that sort of vindicates everything. But Burnley and company just weren't willing to evolve. And as far as Sheffield United were, are concerned, the same thing can be said about them. Hacking Bottom, who, Bottom, who was um, manager at the time, I don't know, quite know what work he did. And maybe they uh, probably went into this, um, uh, came into the uh, premiership this season with that fear of failure, knowing how badly it went for them last time around. And of course, last time, um, it was, of course, um, Chris Wilder at the helm, and he's come back now. And Wilder wasn't quite able to do anything to save them that time. And he's powerless to do anything um, right now. And of course, a certain Mr. Ramsdale was in goal that season, too. Yeah. But. Um, it's a, it's a question of the teams not being re really willing to um, do a lot more because they think they they thought that maybe they had they had, they you know they did well enough to finish in the top two, but um, that was the big mistake they made. You've got to evolve. You've got to make sure you get the players you need. You've got to make sure you um, do your homework. And I think they failed to do that. As far as Luton are concerned, though, under Rob Edwards, they did do their homework. They. Mm -hmm obviously had to huff and puff and fight to get into the premiership by the uh, playoff final. And uh, ever since then, they've been showing a great deal of spirit. And I think um, with the uh, lack of accomplishment comparatively, there haven't been too many expectations of them staying up, but uh, they've confounded everyone and they've done really well. It does seem to be a bit of um, an indictment really on the levels that when you finish in the top two in the championship, but you can't hack it in the premiership, you go straight back down. And yeah. in stark contrast, Leicester City, who were relegated, now look more than likely to come back up. Although, let's not forget, this Leicester team not too long ago won the Premier League. Mm -hmm. They went on to win the FA Cup under Brendan Rodgers. And they've had great um, adventures in Europe, very nearly reaching the semi-finals of the Champions League, very nearly qualifying for the Europa League um, final. And... Um, it was just um, tragic how they fell away. But um, even with um, Vardy playing a bit part role, Jamie Vardy, that is, they look like they're coming back up. Now, at this stage of the season, I've actually got the championship table in front of me. Yeah. And uh, Leicester's form does look to be a little bit inconsistent. Their last five games, I don't know if it's the correct order, but it says D-L-W-W-L. So they've been up yeah. and down. And Ipswich as well have... Um, you know, I think their last two games only saw them pick up a point. And uh, the other teams, of the other teams, Coventry City have been quite disappointing because they were also up there, but they've also faded away a little bit. Mm. It looks as though it could be um, Leicester and Ipswich, but Leeds are also one point behind them and playing brilliantly. And don't forget, Leicester City do have a game in hand. Yes. I get your point. I get your point when you say that having led for so long, it shouldn't um, have, have come down to the situation where the other teams are playing catch-up. But I guess it just goes to show that you cannot afford to let your guard down. You cannot afford to be complacent. You cannot afford to, you know, just um, hope that things will turn out well. And uh, whenever you do have a poor result, say, I'm all right, Jack. Let's move forward and don't look back. Um You've got to really analyze everything and you've got to make sure you um, do better. And of course, as an Arsenal fan, I can testify that what happened to us last season was so painful. We yeah. were top of the league 93% um, of the way, but then got pipped to the post, finishing second in a one horse race, as, one, as people would say. And um, to this day, we are still, you know, um, ribbed about it. And as well as we're doing right now, we may be top by top of the league but on goal difference. Leicester City are also top on goal difference, but they also do have a game in hand. And their goal difference is better than ours, mind you. So there is a part of me that thinks that if they win their game in hand, they should move, move forward. But a look at the table will tell you that Southampton also have two games in hand. Although yeah. if they win both of those games, they will end up being on 84 points, still some way behind um, the top three. But... Um, it, if it does um, come to pass that Leicester, Leeds and Southampton do come back into the Premiership, you know, you have to ask some questions about the levels here because you don't want to have a situation where teams are too good for the Championship but can't hack it um, the division above. Like, let's say if um, you take the case of Wrexham, they, were, they got back into the Football League after winning their uh, conference, of course, and uh, they've had some struggles 
And they also lost uh, Ben Foster, who decided to retire uh, midway. I believe he should have stuck around till the end of the season as a squad player to provide the team some moral support. But, um, you know, it just goes to show that there are going to be levels and it's not really a nice um, thing. So it will remain to be seen what happens. And all I can say in reply to your question is that the onus will be on Leicester City and Ipswich Town to get that second wind and just to make sure that they get propelled um, back to where they should be and try and stop the other teams from gaining on them. Now, of course, um, it is basically a three-way battle. Southampton, West Bromwich um, and Norwich are still some way away in terms of um, points. <clears throat> but um, Leeds will want to avoid being in that three to six um, block because that puts them into the uh, playoffs. I think it's just a, ca a case of, um, you know, a slight um, stumble. And um, Leicester should be able to find a way to overcome it. But if they don't, and they somehow, heaven forbid for them, of course, end up going into the playoffs, and they will look at, at back on that mid-season slump or, or that more recent slump and say, you know what, that cost us in a way. And um, you can also definitely say that Aston Villa are going through a bit of a slump right now. How they could... Um, you know, go from being 2-1 up against Brentford to end up going 3-2 um, behind and having to depend on Ollie Watkins to save their bacon and still be unable to find a, a late winning goal. It just goes to show that you've got to be on your, um, on, on your game from the first whistle to the last. You can't be a first-half team, uh, a Jekyll and Hyde team that performs in the second of uh, the first half but crumbles in the second or vice versa. You can't do that. And... Um, Aston Villa, who will, of course, be playing um, Lille tonight in a very interesting game, although the uh, people where I live have somehow, in their infinite wisdom, not opted to uh, broadcast that. Shame on them, I say. Um, they're, still, they're now going to sort of understand... Uh, gonna, they're basically now um, struggling with the effects of not being able to improve their squad. They only got Morgan Rogers in the transfer window. And hopefully if they manage to limp over the line and get Champions League football, and hopefully for them win the Conference League, I believe the revenue that they pick up should enable them to buy some players. I really don't want them to be put in a situation where they have to sell the likes of Douglas Louise and Ollie Watkins to balance their books and not get any um, replacements in between. And that's where financial fair play could come into this. Who's to say that um, the likes of these clubs who could get promoted might not end up having to toe the line with regard to FFP and have their um, systems being affected as a result. But again, without digressing too far, I think Leicester and Ipswich should be able to find their second win. And it's really up to them to, to uh, make sure they end their seasons with a flourish. And I do still think that of the uh, teams at the top, they do seem to be the most equipped. They're the be they've been the best performing, most consistent teams so far. Southampton have looked good, but <laughs> not quite been able to, um, you know, sh to uh, build on their promise. Leeds have obviously shown that they are willing to battle because they like they love being in the Premiership, obviously. And some of the other teams who um, have who were challenging earlier on have started to um, fade a little bit. There is still some way to go because let's not forget. Uh, the uh, championship is a uh, 46-game season. Yep. Actually, you know what? Most of the teams only have about six games left. So in these six games, I now stand corrected. This is going to decide um, who will rise to the top. Well, it's it's very, very interesting, this. And, you know, that's why I wanted to bring it up, because Leicester, I think, have got the advantage they have, of course, as you say, got that game in hand. But their form has not been particularly very good under Enzo. Um, and the thing is, is there is a lot of clouds hanging over them because of PSR. We'll come back to that in a moment because, of course, we did mention, you did mention Aston Villa there. And actually, it'd be quite interesting to get your thoughts on that and what they might need to do during the summer. But... Leicester, when we look at it, they've got this cloud hanging over them. They got beat by Millwall midweek, a side who are have really digressed this season. Um, you know, of course, John Berylson, who ran that club so, so well, sadly passed away um, at the end of last season. Um, and they just don't seem to have got 
don't seem to have got the mojo back that they had, you know, last year. And, of course, the year before as well, because they come to Dean Court last game of the season before we were promoted to the Premier League. Um, and we did win that game. If we hadn't, you know, they would have had that chance to have climbed into the top six. So, you know, Millwall have struggled, but managed to get a decent result against Leicester. It's an interesting, it's an interesting league because that same Millwall, if I'm right in thinking, got beat by Rotherham. Leeds United, when I look at them, and the Leeds fans are going to hate me for saying this, I personally think that Leeds are going to miss out. I agree with you that the top two are going to finish as the top two. I think Leicester will limp over the line, you know, and that Chris won't be happy with me saying that, but I think they'll get over the line, but they'll limp over the line because of all the clouds hanging over them. Uh, their form hasn't been particularly good. They have got that game in hand. The problem for Leeds is that there is that power of expectation. There is that power of we should be there. You know, up until very recently, they were the form side. They were easily the best side in the championship. Leicester have been on this dip. Leeds were fantastic. They got to the summit and then it's all just fallen apart. And I think as they're getting closer to this, you know, to to the finishing line, they're struggling more and more. I'm going to make a real statement now because personally, I think they've got the hardest running. And, you know, I might be, uh, you know, I might be eating my own words, you know, in a couple of weeks' time. I think they've got the hardest running, but I think this team will win the league. And I think that's Ipswich because there is no expectation. Have they got a better squad than Leicester and Leeds? Most definitely not. But they remind me of what Luton did at the end of last season. And they will push themselves over the line. You know, Kiefer Moore, the big man up front, they'll get the ball into him. Uh, Sam Morsey in that squad as well. Leif Davis, you know, a very, very agile player. We know him so well here. Um, I think Ipswich will win the league. I honestly do, because that expectation, they didn't come into this season, you know, expecting to be in this race. They didn't come into it. In fact, if I'm right in thinking, you know, and I will need to double check this, I think 442 Magazine or somebody of that ilk had them to be relegated back to League One this season. And I think, personally... They'll win the league because of that expectation. What I'm also going to say, though, and Leeds fans are going to absolutely detest me. And to be honest, you know, I really do. I've got on very, very well with Leeds fans. In fact, you know, we had the square ball on here. Um, you know, Dan Moylan, absolutely lovely guy. You know, I've always got on very, very well with them. Forget what happened all those years ago. It was terrible. But at the same time, um, you know, it's a different generation that we've, of Leeds fans that we've got now. Um, I know some videos were going around where people had twisted my words. I never said, you know, oh, Leeds fans, I really like you. Don't worry about what happened all those years ago. It was a case that, you know, it's a different generation. It's a different type of people. And, you know, I've always got on with these Leeds fans. But... I'm going to really upset them now. I'm sorry, Leeds fans. I think they'll be staying in the championship because that power of expectation. They expect to be promoted. There is there's no other view for Leeds but other than to be promoted to the Premier League. You know, I might make them a little bit happier now. They're a club with their size that should be in the Premier League. They should be in the Premier League. They're, they're, they're a well, 
well-supported club. They are one of the staples of English football. You know, I'm not, you know, just blowing their trumpet here, but I think they will miss out on promotion altogether. The main reason being is they've hit a wobble at just the worst time. I might eat my own words and fair play to Leeds fans. If, if you do it, congratulations to you, but I can see them missing out completely because They'll go into that playoffs places. They'll have missed out on automatic promotion. That already will affect the players. They'll then have that expectation going into the playoffs. Norwich City, for example, are the most likely side to play them, but it could be West Brom and Jelbian, a side who are well known for being in the playoffs and, you know, have got that little bit of pedigree of, you know, not particularly doing well in the playoffs, but, you know, what I mean is they've got that pedigree of, you know, they know what it's all about. Um, you know, it's that case of how many times do you go in the playoffs and then fail just to get across the line? Um, I think one of those two teams, you know, really will offer some real threats. And of course, Coventry, who they've recently been beaten by. So, yeah, I've got to say sorry to Leeds fans that I don't think... You know, if they miss out on automatic promotion, I think they'll miss out on promotion altogether. Not because they haven't got one of the best squads in the league. They probably have got the best squad in the league, but they've got that power of expectation. What do you reckon, Manny? Well, I would agree with you, but let's not forget that this Leeds team has already had the um, uh, heartbreak of um, almost getting to the getting back to the Premiership and not quite getting there. I think mm-hmm. before the last time they came back, they were in the uh, playoff rounds and they made the playoff final only to lose to Watford 3 0. And that really crushed them in many ways. And, um, you know, it's a little bit like the more times you um, fail at the final hurdle, the more you end up learning. And yeah. it's as if because you become so acquainted with that, instead of um, allowing it to completely break you, it just, um, you know, makes you stronger. You take a licking, you keep on ticking, and you just um, work at it, and um, you go all over again. And, um, you know, I I really don't um, wish to talk about Arsenal that much. I know we will later on, but there are some expectations from fans. that The licking that we got last season has enabled us to keep on ticking so far. I would remind people, though, that at this stage last season, we were top by an even bigger margin, but we ended up, you know, completely uh, mucking it up. And uh, goal difference is no um, margin. It doesn't even count as a margin until the end of the season. So with Leeds, they've been disappointed before. And when you are able to cope with um, repeated failures, you know, you have this um, belief and say um, uh, to to the self-belief, enough self-belief to say, you know what? We know the hurt. And some players in that um, that Leeds team have um, tasted the pain of failing to qualify for uh, of failing to get promotion to the Premiership. So they know the hurt. Mm. The fans know the hurt, and the fans will obviously want them to erase that pain. So I'm actually going to disagree, and I think Leeds are very well equipped to go on and qualify, if only because the other teams that you've mentioned will probably look to depend on being good on the day. But are they going to be completely good enough given their points differentiation? And I also am smart enough to know that there have been several teams promoted via the playoffs who didn't do well enough to finish in the top um, three or even the top four. But, um, you know, because they performed well in two one-off games, they ended up um, getting getting, um, promoted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's sort of sometimes the the way it is. But... Are those teams in question all the more equipped? And I'm glad you mentioned the run-ins because I've actually got Leicester's um, run-in right now. They've got a game in hand. That game is against uh, Plymouth on the 12th of April, I believe. Then they play um, West Bromwich Albion at home, Southampton at home, which could be difficult along with uh, the Albion. Preston shouldn't be too difficult. And Blackburn are a team which could very well prove to be be kingmakers for Mm. Leicester and... uh, Leeds, I think, because Leeds also play uh, Blackburn late on the season. Yes, they play Blackburn on Saturday the 13th of April, having drawn against Sunderland in their previous game. Then uh, Leeds um, play Middlesbrough at uh, the Riverside Stadium. 
They travel to um, London to play QPR. And they also end with a tough tie against the Southampton team who are also <laughs> trying to um, gain prom promo promotion. And bear in mind, this Southampton team have two games in hand. So even if winning those two games in hand won't um, bring them up a position, if they win those two games in hand, they could very well be in a very in a position of strength going into the final days. As far as Ip Ipswich are concerned, they play Middlesbrough, they play Hull City. Coventry City could be a tough um, game, except City have also fallen away. And they end their campaign with a home game against uh, Huddersfield Town. Shout out to Ryan Mather from Huddersfield Town yes. Fan, Fan TV. I know that he came on the channel not too long ago, and I hope you are watching this, mate. And uh, um, we wish you all the best of luck as you try and avoid another relegation. Uh, mm. After what happened with Warnock and Jepsen last season, I hope your new manager will find a way to um, take you um, um, to keep to keep you safe and prevent you from getting cut adrift. So, from the looks of things, Ipswich do have uh, marginally the easier run in. Yeah, but um, if Leicester do manage to um, recover their second win and win and start to play as if their lives depend depend on it and really um, get through their last games, they will have earned their um, victory. But they will have to start by winning their game in hand against Plymouth because if they fail to do so, then it will be squeaky backside time. And as far as Leeds are concerned, I still believe that they will be well equipped to um, qualify as playoff winners because I just think that, you know, forget about the expectation. It's um, coping with the failure has also made them even stronger. And I just think that Leeds should be strong enough to go through. But um, if any Leeds fans are watching this, I do not want you to come after my friend, Mr. Beasley here. Okay. We're just <laughs> offering our opinions. You know that he loves a lot of you a lot. I happen to have a, um, a space in my heart for a lot of you um, as well. You know, we have a good, um, we've had a good player exchange um, over the years, obviously. And, um, you know, also manager exchange too. And um, I just think that you lot should be able to come back up. But the most important thing for all three teams is do not make the mistake that Burnley and Sheffield United made before coming back here. Make sure you do your homework, get some players in, and uh, try and make sure that you prepare well for the following season. And um, in Leicester's case, I think, um, as Craig has mentioned, um, you know, they might be affected by a potential, um, you know, um, squeeze, if not a point seduction. I'm not too mm -hmm. sure what's happening. But, uh, you know, the onus will now be on them to try to uh, make the most of it and uh, try and make sure that they balance their books. But uh, gaining, um, getting promoted back to the Premiership should help them, hopefully. I can't see that the EFL can now give them a points deduction so close to the end of the season. I think it would be grossly unfair. And I think it would be, again, you know, like we spoke about, you know, and I spoke about in that video, uh, we spoke about it in Cherry Picking um, 42, where we spoke about Richard Masters, the golden share, the integrity of the league, you know, would be put thrown into question. The championship, the integrity of the championship would be thrown into question if Leicester City were to be deducted any points at this point in time. Now, next season, what happens next season is a different scenario. Um Personally, I can't see why they should get points deduction in the EFL if they were to miss out on promotion. With regards to the Premier League, the question again has to be Man City and Chelsea. What is going on with those two? You know, and can you then turn around and say Everton and Forest, if one of those gets relegated, it, honestly, it's just a complete mess. But Manny, if I said, a one, two, and through the playoffs, who are you going for? Leicester, Ipswich, and Leeds United. I just think the other teams in the top six at the moment are just, um, you know, not really uh, strong enough or really, um, uh, really have that uh, backbone to really, you know, get themselves over the line at the moment. Southampton were impressing, but they've fallen away. And I just don't see them being able to... Uh, come back and uh, make things happen. Fair enough. Um, my one, I am going to mix it up here. Um, I think Ipswich are going to win it. I think Leicester will finish second. I am sorry, Lee Sens. You know, I, I, it's not... 
there is no preference against anybody because the side that everybody is probably thinking that I'm going to say West Brom or Jelbian, I don't think it's going to be them, regardless of how much I think of Carlos Corbran. Um, you know, great manager, great man as well. Looking at, you know, the recent form and them sneaking into the playoff places, I'm going to go for Ipswich, Leicester and Norwich. Norwich, I think, will come back up. I think they have just hit it at the right time. I think they've hit it at the right time. Um, West Brom, too many draws. You know, um, Norwich have been beaten, have been beaten in the last five, but they've also won three. Um, the only other team who has got an equal record is their near neighbours. Their dear neighbours. They're friends. So, yes, we will see how I see it, an East Anglia derby in the Premier League next season, um, which will be quite interesting. Um, Ipswich have been below Norwich for many, many years. And, uh, yeah, if they're both in the Premier League together, uh, that's going to be a bit spicy, isn't it? Um, Oh, yeah, (laughs) indeed. You know, I'll tell you what, though, any derbies are always going to be, um, Mm -hmm. you know, spicy affairs. And I'll tell you what, another set of derbies that we've missed are the uh, Tyne Weir derbies and the Tyne Tees derbies. So Middlesbrough and Sunderland might need to get um, back up to the Premiership ASAP. But, um, you know, again, it is an interesting prediction for you to say that Norwich could end up coming back in. And um, I'll tell you what. It um, wouldn't necessarily be too um, bad a thing if they uh, got back up. And uh, they've also provided a great deal of um, entertainment over the years. But I am looking forward to seeing Ipswich back in the Premiership. Like yeah. Norwich, they were founding members of the Premier League. And there was a time, of course, when they were one of the top teams in the Premier League with um, players like Craig Forrest, Chris Kawamia, and others. And um, they were, of course, expected to do um, really, really good things in the league and in Europe, but then they just um, fell away. We all know about um, Ipswich's European history, having been UEFA Cup winners back in the day under Bobby Robson, Lord rest his soul. So it will be good to see um, Ipswich back in many ways. And this is why, one of the things I love so much about seeing championship teams uh, get promoted to the Premiership. They've got so many unique stories. Luton, of course, was supposed to be in the Premier, uh, founder members of the Premier League, but they got relegated in '92. Now they're back and enjoying a taste of the high life. And um, other teams as well, um, Huddersfield Town, Cardiff City, Swansea, and several others. And sadly, they've all ended up going um, back um, down. And one team you also do feel for is Oldham Athletic, who were founder members of the uh, yeah. Premier League, but simply have lost their way so drastically. It's um, really saddening in many ways. But um, this um, championship does seem to be quite interesting, and I am also looking at it with uh, some interest, even if I don't get TV coverage of that over here in my neck of the woods. But, um, yeah, really interesting to see what happens with these teams in question. And, um, I mean, I've made my prediction, you made yours, and we'll see um, what uh, transpires at the end of it all. Yeah. I'll also make a very, very quick prediction as well. Um of course, I've said the three teams that I think will get promoted. Said Leicester will finish second, but when they get into the Premier League, I think they're probably best equipped. You know, I think Ipswich would have a lot of heart. I think Norwich would have a lot of heart, but I think Leicester would be best equipped. So it's not all bad news, Chris. Don't you worry. It's not all bad news. Um, but I tell you what, let's move back on to AFC Bournemouth because we've got two games coming up. Um, We'll touch on this very briefly. We've got Manchester United coming up on Saturday. Um, A Manchester United side, which seems just a weird, weird, weird club this season. You know, where you expect them to win, they don't. Where you expect them to be beaten by Liverpool, for example, um, they don't. There's no explanation. And then, of course, we travel to Villa Park to face Aston Villa the following week, which we've already said, Aston Villa are struggling with injuries. Uh, They've got this cloud hanging over them, PSR. 
they need to really get in the Champions League to be able to keep the players that they have. Um, and of course, we'll come back to PSR and whether or not that is going to effectively push them back out. Well, this is what I hate about PSR, push them out of establishing themselves as a top six club. Hmm. It is really sad. And obviously, you know, the report that had come out on BBC Sport some time ago, de um, detailing their losses of um, nearly £120 million over the last um, year, not including um, transfers, of course, it was hmm. certainly a bit of a shock to their system. Um, with Aston Villa, it's basically a case of, you know, nothing succeeding like success. And with Unai Emery um, helping the team recover from the perilous position they were in under Steven Gerrard when he got sacked to take them to European qualification by the Conference League. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's got them performing really well and playing a really good a good brand of football with a 4-4-2 slash, um, um, you know, 4-2-3-1 or something like that. And um, they had a purple patch at the beginning of the season. At one point, they had the best home record in the league, but um, reverses to the likes of uh, Newcastle and Manchester United have put um, paid to all of that. And um, but but obviously with the news that the Premier League could be getting five English teams in the Champions League next season, they still have cause to feel reasonably confident that they can um, secure um, fourth or fifth because the other teams, yeah. Newcastle United, are just so far behind them that it's very difficult to see them playing catch-up at this particular point in time. And United, as you've mentioned, have been so up and down, so Jekyll and Heidi, Heidi it's absolutely ridiculous. That Jurgen Klopp choked when he picked Yarrell Kwanzaa and Conor Bradley to start. Mm -hmm. You always pick your strongest defence, and that means Ibrahima Kanate and Joe Gomez at right back, because that pass that Kwanzaa made, which um, Fernandez pounced on, and... Uh, you know, just um, shot past um, Quiven Keller, who was off his line. That pass was suicidal. And the fact that, um, you know, Liverpool escaped from that match with a draw, Kwanzaa owed Mo Salah a sumptuous iftar meal that night. But City, but United really have been so inconsistent. I really can't see the play catch up. I think they'll be lucky to get Conference League this season. Newcastle yeah. under Ed have had so many injuries and they are starting to recover well, but I just think the gap will be a little bit too um, big for them and they also might not have the easiest of run-ins. So Emery is going to have a tough um, game on his hands against um, his former lot, which are, of course, my lot, and uh, Douglas Louise will be suspended. So um, he's going to have to really shuffle his team around. Maybe he might have to play, um, give Morgan Rogers um, another game with uh, Tielemans and McGinn and maybe um, uh, Diaby in that midfield with Bailey and Watkins, um, you know, up front. Uh, in fact, I can tell you right now that their starting lineup against uh, Lille will see them play something looking like a 4-4-1-1 four, four, one, one with uh, John McGinn being the attacking midfield pivot behind Ollie Watkins because Douglas Luiz is not suspended for this game. Bailey will be starting. I do believe Diaby will be on the bench, Musa Diaby. And... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those two players as well have been really key, despite their contrasting form. Maybe they perform better as substitutes, I don't know. Um, big up to uh, Nicola Zaniolo for also recovering. But Aston Villa obviously are going to depend on their own um, league form being a lot better in the closing stages of the season. But I can also tell you that Spurs being Spurs, as well as they perform in some games this season, they also will start to choke when the pressure gets high. Although I do remember a few seasons ago being on the wrong end of that when Tottenham pipped us to fourth place when Antonio Conte was manager for barely half a season. So qualifying for the Champions League and winning some silverware will give them some standing and will obviously help them in many ways, but they will still have to sell a few players to balance the books. Um, the only question th thing would be they might have to start by getting rid of some players who are now... Um, firmly fringe players who won't really have a role to play. I'm suspecting the likes of the former Arsenal and Fulham defender Callum Chambers will be one of them, and maybe one or two others. And um, there could they defer, depend upon some free transfers or some good players um, purchased on knockdown prices? I could see him going for someone like uh, Akir and Tierney, who will have his uh, transfer price halved, having had um, injury-affected seasons at Arsenal and now Real Sociedad. 
If they sell Douglas Luiz, could they go for someone like a Matteo Genduzzi from Lazio? If they are forced to sell Ollie Watkins, could they possibly uh, give someone like a Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang a final shot in the Premiership and the Champions League? Um, there are so many questions that will have to be asked. But the biggest priority will be that Aston Villa will have to do whatever it takes to balance the books. But qualifying for Europe will do a lot in terms of merchandise sales. And with Newcastle, you have to say that had it not been for the Tonali issue and the injuries they've picked up, they would almost certainly have made a really good mark in the Champions League, never mind um, doing uh, consolidating their position in the Premier League. I mean, they started with... Um, a fine performance in the San Siro against AC Milan and blew away mm. a Paris Saint-Germain team at Saint, um, that looked out of sorts at St. James's Park. But then things started to crumble with a loss away from home to, uh, at home to Borussia Dortmund. They were beaten by the Germans away from home as well. And sadly, they just couldn't make it as the injuries started to, you know, mount and the Tonali suspension took place. So... Championship League, Champions League qualification alone won't guarantee that the team will be in good health next season. But mm -hmm. Eddie Howe is no Unai Emery. And Unai Emery has got some really, really top quality men working with him at the Villa. So I actually am an optimist about them. I've admired the football they play. I really admire and respect Emery as a manager. It didn't work out with us. And I think he had to leave because, you know, he wasn't getting the support and the respect he deserved. And the football wasn't really looking good. So sadly, he had to be on his way. But I've always maintained that he is a quality, quality manager. And I wouldn't, I would definitely love to see them qualify for the Champions League. I would not be happy if they end finish the season above us, which could potentially happen, yeah. although it would take a ma massive slump for, on our part for that to happen. And if it does happen, it will put Arteta's uh, credentials into perspective, it has to be said. But um, Villa should be able to um, recover and qualify for the Champions League, and hopefully that will help them you know, um, offset their finances. I would go so far to say that Bournemouth will be on a little bit of a hiding to nothing, and you're going to have to select a really attacking team that could get in behind their um, midfield and their, you know, really um, wafer-thin uh, defence at times. Because whenever they started with Clement Longley, I have not been convinced by him. I think Diego Carlos reminds me a little bit of Martin Keown. Strong as an ox and um, very, you know, rock-like, but can also be very clumsy indeed. With an injury to Matthew Cash, Esri Consa has had to deputise at right back. And although he is um, good as a stabling influence, he doesn't overlap them um, very often, although he did score a really good goal um, against, I forget who the opposition was that day, but uh, it was a fight. Yeah, it was Wolves, I remember. Gary O'Neill's Wolves. It, um, I think he went across it, but because he hit the outside of his boot, it sailed over Jose Sain into the net. So if you can field an attacking team, that could get in behind that defence, um, you should be fine. But your own defensive worries could mean that um, Bailey, Watkins and company could take advantage of, of them. As for Manchester United, they've got more defensive problems. They've got yes. more defensive problems. So this should be the signal for Tavernier, Cloyvert and company to really go hard and go at them. And in United's last two games, Dallow and wan Saka have been used, switched around at white, right and left back. And at left back, basically, they've uh, both conceded penalties against Chelsea and Liverpool. So I'm confident enough to predict that you should be able to get um, a good draw against Manchester United, which will damage their hopes even further. As far as Aston Villa are concerned, I think you will give um, the villains a tough game. I'm still thinking that they might be at least marginally better and you could end up on the wrong end of a 2-1 defeat. But... Um, if you perform well in these two games, that should stand you in good stead for the rest of the season, depending on your running. No, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, hopefully, fingers crossed, we can have a good run in. But there is one final question that I want to ask you, Manny. By all Here means. Go. You're in pole position now. Surely this Barely. is it. Surely this is it. You can do this. You're going to hate me for saying this. I would you know, hope I... so. <laughs> Mr. Beasley, I've, met, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I could never hate you for anything. I could never hate you full stop. <laughs> you and I Fair are always going to be exceptionally tight. Yes. And I know that when you predicted that Arsenal would win the title at mm -hmm. the beginning of the season, you were offering your opinion. You said it as it was and you believed that um, 
I think one of the reasons why you predicted it that way was because you thought that we were wiser for the experience. Um, obviously, getting Declan Rice in the team has helped um, immeasurably. I won't deny that. But uh, there have been several games where we've been shown to have a bit of a soft centre, lose concentration at the back, and we end up you know, conceding uh, some goals. And uh, that run over Christmas and the New Year where we um, lost some uh, poor games and didn't pick up the points we need could very well come back to haunt us. And a lot of people are going to say that because of the top three, we've had the most um, points in this three-way battle. By rights, we should be um, favourites to win. But Chris and also Ant from Ant's um, Leicester fan channel, big up to him too. I'd love to see you do a collaboration with him sometime. Um, they will know that when they won the Premiership, we were the only team to do the double against them, beat them home and away. Yep, you it were. meant nothing. It meant nothing in the end because we finished second and by a long way. So let's also not forget the impact that the uh, chastening draw against Bayern Munich in the Champions League could have. Will that lead to some self-doubt creeping in? Will that lead to the players um, starting to think that maybe, you know, um, we might not get it? Because I'm going to tell you one thing. A lot of people have been waxing lyrical about the Brentford Loney goalkeeper, David Rea. He has started to look very, very shaky. And he was definitely, in my opinion, at fault for both the goals that we conceded. His uh, distribution and his kicking have not been up to scratch in recent times. And there will be some cracks starting to form. Some people might just not really want to, um, you know, take notice of them as of yet. We have to objectively look at teams and say, you know what? Yes, we are good. Yes, Aston Villa this weekend will be weakened by the loss of Douglas Luiz. But we have to get our own midfield in order. We have to make sure our defense is spot on. And, you know, even despite Aston Villa's defensive worries, they've always got the world champion in goal who on his day, and he, he always, who more often than not has great days than bad days, can be an absolute monster and a behemoth and the difference between a victory and a defeat. So they're not a team that we can take for granted. And I've said this on several streams. If we fail to win this game, or if, heaven forbid, we lose this game to our former boss, our former goalkeeper, and also one of our former defenders who could be in the squad, this could be the beginning of the end of our championship challenge. Because you just know that Liverpool and City will be determined to power through and not drop points at any stage. Well, I honestly I'm think... I'm, ho I'm hoping for the best, but preparing yeah. for the worst. That's always your tagline, Manny. I think, you know, I did think earlier on, you know, when Liverpool were, you know, doing well, I thought, you know, it's Klopp's final season there. You know, I can see them winning it. However, it has dipped off a little bit. I can see you doing it. I can see you getting over the line. And there is one player who has only played one game for Arsenal, was incredibly unlucky earlier on in the season, who I think is going to come back. He could well be in the squad, I was reading, for this Aston Villa game, Jurian Timber from Ajax. And I think, you know, considering what a season he's had and the frustrations, I think he could be like, well, he's a brand new signing for you, but, you know, I think he could help get you across the line. Um, so I stay with my prediction earlier on the season. I think you're going to do it, Manny, but... Um... I, will, I, I, I will be brief on Timber and say this. Do not underestimate the impact of a long-term ACL injury. Yes. Former Cherry Tyrone Mings is still of out. Course. And there were reports about him returning to training. Mm -hmm. um, but he still hasn't featured in any match day squad since then. Will he come back before the end of the season? I do not know. And I do not believe that Emery will want to run the risk of rushing him back in. If he is in the squad tomorrow, um, happy days. But I do not see him playing. And uh, it will also be very interesting to see how well he will do against the likes of Leon Bailey and or Musa Diaby. And the worst part about inverted left backs, right footers who play at the left back um, area, yeah. is that they simply do not have the ability to um, 
cope when a right winger goes around their left side, yeah. unless they have a more than decent left foot. The reason why Dennis Irwin did as well as he did at Manchester United was because, in a, despite being you know predominantly right-footed and preferring to use his right foot for everything, whether it was set pieces or what have you, he had a more than um, capable left foot of his own, which is more that can be uh, said um, about the likes of um, other defenders like um, Takahiro Tomiyasu or any other one who plays in that inverted position, which I call perverted inverted. And ironically, Alexander Zinchenko is left-footed, but he cuts into the midfield because he's a midfielder by trade and Arteta wants him to do that. And it leaves us defensively stretched. So um, that's going to be another thing to consider. And um, after the arrogance of him letting Kieran Tierney go, who was perfect as a traditional left back, we've had to try and bridge the gap by playing Jakob Kivior in at left back. He's a left center back, so he is left footed, but can't quite overlap for Toffee and was um, spun all the way around by Leroy Sané on Tuesday. So, you know, we're, we're back um, where we started, and I don't want to run the risk of rushing Timber back in um, sim um, if things get tight, because you know that if, it, um, if we, if we um, fail, it's um, going down, and we're not yelling Timber because it's not going to be his fault, but we're going to be yelling Arteta and Edu and all the others for not doing enough to really strengthen the squad where it needs to be strengthened. But I appreciate your prediction. And I do respect your opinion. And as I said, I am hopeful that we will win. And if we do win, then I promise you one of these days, I'm going to come over to Bournemouth and I'm going to make sure you get a Guinness on me. Do you like Guinness, mate? Yeah, I like a Guinness. Perfect. I like Guinness. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I know that Guinness is more of the uh, drink of choice for people up in the north um, of the country. Um, yes. And I know that Southerners tend to prefer cider or bitter or what have you, but um, you can never tell. Me, I love my alcohol of all types, and I am not promoting drinking on this channel. I promise you. To be honest, I'm not a cider drinker. Uh, to be honest, uh, I don't drink bitter very much either. The one I do drink, and I'll tell you what I do drink, um, is if you've ever tried Brew Dog Hazy Jane, what it is, it's like a fruity lager. Uh, Cronenberg Blanc as well was always one of my. Oh, choices. Cronenberg Blanc, that is yeah. good. That is See, good. See, they got that. rid of it in the UK for years. You know, that was what all I drank at university. You know, that's where most of my student loan went. But you know, <laughs> oh, <laughs> that oh, and boy. Hooters. But that's another day. That's another story for another day. Um, but, but yes, um, I judge you for the Hooters a bit, and I will explain that later. <laughs> but we have to wrap it up now. Chris yeah. is waiting for you. Most definitely. Well, Manny, thank you again for coming on. No doubt. We'll do this next week. Um, do remember to like and subscribe, guys, to this channel. Um, it does help this channel grow. And I won't say who, but we have got some very, very special guests coming on for our opposition previews this week. Um, so keep your eyes peeled. Until the next one. Up the cherries, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for joining us.